everyone. Welcome to this conference hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. I'm your host, Kimani Hendricks, and I'm joined by Dr. Fred Foley, who will be addressing managing emotional changes. Dr. Foley received his PhD in clinical psychology from Fordham University. He is the professor of psychology at Furkoff Graduate School of Psychology of Yeshiva University, Bronx, New York and the Director of Neuropsychology at Holy Name Medical Center's MS Center. He has published over 150 scientific articles, book chapters, and abstracts, and his translational research on depression and immune dysregulation in MS won the Dorfman Award from the Academy of Psychosomatic Medicine. He has served on the Medical Advisory Committee of the National MS Society and served as president of the consortium of MS Centers, or the CMSC. The CMSC dedicated an award in his name, the Fred Foley Award, which is given annually to a person who has contributed greatly to advances in treatment of neuropsychiatric disorders in MS. Dr. Foley also received a Giant of MS Award from the CMSC this year for his work. He has been the recipient of numerous research and educational grants from the federal government and private foundations, has served on many scientific committees, and has been an advisor or consultant for numerous for-profit and nonprofit organizations on MS-related topics. We will address all questions and comments after the presentation. Meanwhile, Dr. Foley, thank you for being with us this afternoon. The floor is yours to begin. Thank you, Kamani. Welcome, everybody, to um, Managing mood changes in MS. First, we're going to talk about what kinds of mood changes typically occur in MS and how often. And then we're going to talk about how to manage those, those changes. So there are a number of emotional uh, disorders that have been associated with MS, um, such as mood and anxiety disorders. Um, there's higher rates in MS than in uh, matched control populations of some anxiety disorders and, and uh, depressive disorders. And these changes are as associated with uh, decreased quality of life and uh, functional impairments. So it's very important to recognize and address these changes when they occur. There's also uh, a disturbance of uh, affect called pseudo, pseudo bulbar affect, which is kind of a disconnection between one's inner mood and the expression of emotion. So there are a number of factors that contribute to this uh, complex relationship between MS and emotional disorders. <clears throat> there are genetic and psychosocial risk factors. There are um, response to immunological and inflammatory changes in the brain. There are uh, you know, MS lesions in the brain can cause uh, uh, structural issues that can lead directly to mood changes. There's also the response to a chronic illness, you know, uh, ex response to ex exacerbations. Uh, there's other MS symptoms like pain, fatigue, uh, and cognitive impairment that can lead someone to become anxious or depressed. And some symptomatic MS treatments, uh, like uh, high-dose corticosteroids, may cause some transient uh, mood changes in people who are at risk. In looking at how often mood and anxiety disorders in the MS population occur, their um, their major depressive disorder, which is a, a a clinically significant depression. There is increased incidence of that and anxiety disorder and adjustment disorder, as well as bipolar disorder in MS. And unfortunately, psychiatric disorders are often undiagnosed and untreated in people with MS. Um, in one study, 30% of participants who did not report a diagnosis of depression, and 15% of those who did not report any mental disorder had depression scale scores consistent with probable major depression. So uh, 
it's it's important to screen for this. I know some clinics do and some uh, clinics don't, but it's important to get screened for uh, depression and anxiety and uh, be aware of what the symptoms are so that if you are feeling depressed or anxious, you can go tell your healthcare team about it and you can get help for it. In terms of uh, uh, the incidence of depression in MS, uh, about one to 4% of people with MS will develop a depression you know, uh, per year. And over a five-year period, about 35% uh, you know, will kind of develop it. Uh, so uh, again, there, there's a, a depression tends to occur earlier in the disease process as people come to terms with having MS. Uh, and then kind of uh, the prevalence of it decreases. There's, but when a great disability accumulates in those individuals who are unfortunate enough to have high levels of disability, then that puts them at risk for uh, de depression again. And, you know, again, there's also risk if there's a significant clinical relapse. In terms of anxiety uh, disorders in MS, um, looking at the uh, overall prevalence rates in MS cohorts, it's about 21.9%. And uh, in the general population, it is uh, kind of kind of lower than that. And you can see in this across uh, eight population-based studies, the range of anxiety disorder is very, very uh, variable. But again, uh, that's why you need to do many, many studies in order to really find out uh, what uh, you know the actual present uh, prevalence really is. Pseudobulbar affect is characterized by sudden, brief, exaggerated, and uncontrollable expressions of laughing or crying that may be incongruent with your mood. So you may be feeling okay inside you know, or, or happy and all of a sudden you burst into tears, you know, uh, or you could be feeling sad and burst out laughing. So um, uh, there's a strong overlap between the pseudobulbar affect in MS and depression. And there's an FDA approved drug that treats this. So if you find yourself getting confused, uh, because your inner mood isn't matching your behavioral expression of mood, then um, you know certainly let your healthcare team know so that you can get treatment for it. I want to talk about uh, when when people are anxious or or depressed. There's changes in their thinking patterns, changes in their feelings, changes in their physical reactions, and changes in their behavior. So when we treat people with uh, MS who, have, who are depressed or anxious. We want to evaluate all these things. What thoughts are going through their head, you know, when their mood kind of uh, turns to the negative? What feelings can they define that are taking place in them? What are their physical reactions or what do they feel like physically? And what are their behaviors at those moments? And the reason we want to kind of evaluate all these things is because all these things are interrelated. So if you're anxious, your thoughts will change, your feelings will change, your behavior will change, and your body will change. There'll be phys physical reactions to it. Because understanding all these different dimensions of mood changes, you know, will enable us to, de to, to develop interventions in all these areas as well. You know, thinking interventions, behavioral interventions, feeling interventions, and, and physical uh, reactions that, uh, rather physical changes that can impact and improve uh, that mood disturbance. So, um, and, uh, you know, also it's important to know that many uh, moods, actually all moods, are associated with particular types of thoughts. So, for example, let's take anxiety. What thoughts do people have when they're anxious? And uh, by the way, this is your first homework assignment. As a professor, I love to give lots of a homework. So I'm gonna be all give, giving you all homework during this, this seminar for you to take away and practice. 
Um, <clears throat> anxiety is really the expectation that something is going to happen and it's going to be bad. So it's an expectation about the future, you know, not about the present moment. You're expecting a negative outcome to occur. And the feelings associated with that, that people say, well, anxious, fearful, guarded, nervous. And what did people do, you know, when they, their behavior frequently when they get anxious, they kind of uh, maybe withdraw or kind of avoid the thing that they're afraid of, or sometimes they get irritable or, or hostile in that context. And physically, when you're feeling anxious, you're going to have increased muscle tension. People tend to change their breathing rates. They breathe more shallowly. And so um, uh, all these things are kind of tied together around anxiety. <clears throat> what is anger? Anger is the feeling that you feel when you want or expect something. You aren't getting it, and you still want or expect it. So anger is also about your expectations. So, um, and the feelings associated with it that people describe are irritable, annoyed, anger, or even rageful. Behavior changes when you're angry. You know, some you may make a verbal attack on someone. Uh, you may kind of be a little hostile towards them or uh, just kind of inwardly irritated. Uh, Physically, there's increased muscle tension, there's an outpouring of adrenaline, rapid breathing takes place, and there's changes in the brain with each mood too. You know, um, kind of studies at, at Harvard have found that when people are angry, they can see changes on functional magnetic resonance imaging uh, studies. And, um, uh, and uh, those kinds of changes are associated with anger. So every mood state has associated brain changes that occur in how the different regions of the brain are interconnecting, in what circuits are getting activated or inhibited. So again, there's an underlying, you know, uh, central nervous system response to all moods. Sadness. Uh, sadness is also kind of about your expectations. Sadness is the feeling that you feel when you expect or want something, you're not getting it, and you give up hope of ever getting it. So when that occurs, you know, then, you know, you're going to feel sad. So part of understanding mood changes is understanding the thoughts the expectations that go along with mood changes. Because frequently, our expectations are kind of like a, a not in sync with reality. Um, I can give you an example from myself. You know, when I was a, a new assistant professor at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, well, I have to drive from New Jersey into the Bronx. And I used to get irritated in traffic all the time and annoyed. And I realized I was, I was expecting there not to be an accident. I was expecting there not to be, um, you know, road closures on my commute. And then I woke up one morning and started laughing at myself. I said, Fred, what are you expecting? The busiest highway, you know, in the United States and the busiest bridge will just open up for you and allow you to easily and peacefully commute to work each day. And so what I did was I, I, analyzed my expectations. I was expecting there, you know, not to be traffic or not to be accidents or not to have road closures. And I realized those expectations were just not in sync with the reality of traveling across the bridge and on that highway. And so I adjusted my expectations. So now when I'm driving, I expect there to be road closures. I expect there to be people who are texting and uh, kind of veering into my lane and cutting me off. And since I expect that now. I don't get irritated when I'm driving anymore. So why? Because my expectations are now aligned with the reality of driving where I drive. So one of the key things that we teach people, you know, when they find, they tell me that, oh, I'm chronically upset, I'm chronically irritated and annoyed at this, is to evaluate what are they expecting? 
or wanting and not getting it, but still expecting it or want it? And is that in line with reality? So, um, you know, for example, I, I was working with one person with MS who um, was chronically frustrated and angry every single day because um, he kind of lost the dexterity and fine motor coordination in his fingers and was struggling with different things. It would take him a little longer to button button his shirt, for example. It would take him a little longer to do things. He, he, would, he told me he dropped a screwdriver one time and it annoyed him. So I, I said to him, and we worked together to get him to change his expectations. Now he expects it to take a longer to kind of button his shirt. He expects to drop things now. And he said his frustration and chronic irritability has gone away. He's more at peace with the reality of this, this change due to the MS. And so his mood has improved, you know, because of he was able to identify and change those expectations that were not in sync, you know, with the reality of the changes that have come with his MS. So basically, when we talk about stress and mood, ma mood management, the first thing I do is to help, help people do an assessment of, you know, what their daily stressors are, the things that aggravate them, irritate them, and their reactions to that. And uh, I'll give you an example, you know, of, of this. And I already mentioned to you how we approach stress and distress you know, from a cognitive perspective, dealing with, you know, changing your expectations and beliefs. And we also have people approach stress and approach depression and approach anxiety from behavioral and physical perspectives. And we'll talk more about that as well. In terms of the uh, scientific literature on the treatment of anxiety disorders in people with MS, <clears throat> Uh, data from controlled trials are extremely limited at this time, but there are a number of interventions that have been associated, you know, with the reduction of anxiety and improvement of mood in the literature. And uh, uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction, you know, was found to significantly reduce anxiety, and it also reduced uh, depressive uh, symptoms. Um, kind of relaxation training and cognitive behavior therapy have been found to significantly reduce both anxiety and depression and improve uh, people's ability to cope. And biofeedback, when added to relaxation, mindfulness um, exercises, and education has been found to significantly reduce anxiety. And also, the Inter internet delivered behavioral interventions to increase lifestyle physical activities such as kind of exercise has been found to successfully treat anxiety disorders so um you know it, it's it's important for you to know that there are interventions out there you know that can improve anxiety and reduce it and i want to talk a little bit about um you know, cognitive behavior psychotherapy. Cognitive behavior therapy uh, is, you know, a specific type of psychotherapy that improves mood. And the description of it includes, you know, changing your thinking, as I've been talking to you about, you know, how to kind of evaluate your expectations, what are they, and change them so that your mood will improve. And <clears throat> Uh, also behavioral strategies like relaxation and meditation. So uh, cognitive behavior therapy fosters changes in relevant thinking and behavior patterns that leads to increases in different types of coping, problem-focused coping and emotion-focused co coping strategies. And in our studies, uh, we found that we can improve those things in six to 12 weeks, you know, including mood and improving coping strategies. Problem-focused coping strategies are kind of like uh, more problem-oriented. There's a clear problem and uh, we teach people how to go about in sequential stepwise manner to uh, 
address those problems. Emotion-focused coping strategies are what do you do when your mood is bad? How do you soothe yourself? And so it might be talking to someone or getting social support, um, things like that are considered emotion-focused coping strategies. And if we can uh, help people change those coping efforts, we found that's highly correlated with improvement uh, in uh, anxiety and depression, and also better communication, better, uh, better connections, emotional connections with others. And in one study, we found it improved marital satisfaction as well. <clears throat> so this is a, an example of a cognitive behavior therapy a stress record booklet that I give people uh, you know, to kind of evaluate those thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And so what I ask people to do is describe four things in these diaries on a daily basis. Um, and I, I'll ask them to pick, you know, uh, their most distressed moment in the day and a day when they, and a moment that they were feeling better, you know, during the day, because mood varies throughout the day, you know, um, and even if you're depressed or anxious, there are moments in the day when you're going to feel better and less depressed and anxious than other moments in the day. So I ask people to catch two situations per day, one when they're distressed and one when they're feeling better. And they have to first describe the situation. The situation is defined by who is present, what's taking place, and when and where did it occur. It's like taking a snapshot. You want to freeze that moment in time um, and describe it objectively. And then I ask people, what thoughts did you have at that precise moment when your kind of mood was bad? Because we have kind of an ongoing inner dialogue in the back of our heads all day. And I ask people to try to kind of seize that snapshot. What ideas were in their head? What silent monologue uh, was internal? What images were coming into their mind? What feelings were they having? And we defined feelings as one word descriptors of their mood at the moment. Happy, sad, irritated, angry, uh, depressed, joyous, um, jealous, et cetera. And what physical sensations were they feeling at the moment? Were their MS symptoms kind of acting up at the moment? Were they, uh, you know, what was going on physically and what were they aware of physically? So this is a an example of a, a diary from uh, one of the patients I was treating, you know, with this cognitive behavior therapy in a clinical trial. So to give you an example, the, the, what, what was the situation, the uh, distressing situation that uh, occurred that day? So the who, I was by myself, the what, trying to get my work done because I'm taking tomorrow off when, Thursday, just before lunch, where at my office. So you can really see that moment. You know, you can, it's like uh, grabbing that snapshot and you can really picture that situation. So what thoughts were going on in your head at that moment? <clears throat> and you reported, I'll never be able to get all this work done in time. I feel so fatigued. You know, what's the use of trying to finish this? Why did this have to happen to me? What, uh, what were your feelings associated with that moment? He said, nervous and demoralized. And what was your behavior? Just sitting at my desk, staring off into space and physically what you were feeling. He said his MS fatigue was really kicking in at that moment. And he realized his heart was beating faster and he had sweaty palms. So this is what we wanna look at. And this is what we wanna analyze to see, um, are some of those thoughts, do they need to be changed? Like my thinking, you know, about um, you know the George Washington Bridge and the Cross Bronx Expressway that clearly needed to be changed uh, so that it would be more in sync with reality. And then you know if you change one of these things, any of these things, you know you can change the outcomes. We have cognitive biases. You know human beings are not machines, and we we don't think you know uh, in unbiased ways at times. You know for example. Um, a way we help people treat anxiety is seeing if they're catastrophizing, if they're blowing things out of proportion. So um, 
uh, and this is an example uh, from one of my patients, quote, I am late for my meeting. This is a disaster. My boss will hate me, end quote. And that's, you know, when I asked uh, her about that at another time, she says, yeah, yeah, I was kind of making a mountain out of a molehill. Um, and, uh, and she said, I tend to do that. So what I ask her to do is every time she gets anxious about something, and remember, anxiety is about anticipating a future negative outcome. I ask her, how important is this going to be five years from now? The fact that you're late for this particular meeting. And she said, Dr. Foley, five years from now, I'm not even going to remember it a month from now. I said, so if things aren't going to be that important down the road, then maybe you don't have to get so anxious about them now. So the next time you're anxious, and by the way, this is your next homework assignment. The next time you're anxious about something, I want you to ask yourself the question, how important is this going to be five years from now? Um, Overgeneralizing is another type of cognitive bias associated with distress. Um, and this is another quote, uh, and general, overgeneralizing is generalizing about yourself or others based on one event or one mistake. So this is another quote from another um, diary. I, I forgot her name. I have no social skills. I have no grace. And I, I saw this and I, I asked him, so um, you never have any social skills. You never have any grace in any situation with anybody. That's really what you're saying. And he, he laughed at me and said, well, I actually have it most, much of the time. I just didn't have it that one time. So you were overgeneralizing and kind of like kind of being tough on yourself. Uh, also, sometimes people are perfectionists and perfectionism tend to, they tend to overgeneralize as well. Um, and perfectionists sometimes feel there's only one right way to do things and they know what it is. And so this is kind of a quote from one of my patients who was a perfectionist, uh, who was a computer guy. I made a mistake with the new software. I'm such a failure. And I, and I, I said to him, so you're a failure in all things much of the time? Or was that just one situation uh, uh, defined as a failed situation? And again, he realized he was overgeneralizing. So, um, so our thinking can generate a great deal of distress. Um, taking things personally. When you're taking things personally, you kind of have the feeling that that person did something kind of, uh, you know, on purpose to hurt your feelings or um, dismiss you or something else like that. And a lot of times we take things personally when they're really not personal at all. You know, most people are just trying to get through their day. They're oblivious to each other. So um, uh, probably about 90% of the time when you're taking something personally, you're going to be inaccurate in interpreting it in that kind of negative way. So, um, you know, by kind of analyzing your thoughts, you know, in the, these kinds of ways, it'll help keep you having a balanced perspective. So, um, and it's also important for you to help manage mood changes and to help improve your mood, to remind yourself every single day of the gifts that you have in your life, the things that you value, the positives in your life, the, uh, you know, it, it could be that you know your health has been stable for a while. It could be appreciation of family, appreciation of your community, volunteer activities. Just um, remind yourself of the things that are going right in your life, not the things that are going wrong in your life. And so I ask people to exercise that every single day. And um, if you do that for just a couple of minutes a day, it will go to help improve your mood. I also encourage people to be self-compassionate. You know, when people get depressed or anxious, they frequently are very self-critical at those moments. And I ask people to ask themselves the question, if there were a good friend or a loved one 
coming to you with the thoughts and feelings that you have right now or the event you're so concerned about? What would you say to them? You know, how would you show compassion to them? And, you know, uh, so it's important for you to all kind of make sure you show compassion to yourselves, you know, when you're struggling with things. This was a, um, another cognitive bias that one of my patients had. Um, and some people feel that they're worthwhile only if they have other people's acceptance and approval, which we know is kind of impossible to have all the time. Even if you have someone's acceptance and approval today, well, then tomorrow's a new slate and you got to work on it again. So one of my patients was a very gifted music teacher and uh, he, he needed a cane and uh, he didn't want to use a cane uh, because he said, oh, well, people will be looking at me. They'll be thinking I'm disabled. And um, uh, so he didn't use a cane, but then he was kind of like staggering down the street. He would go to um, people's houses to uh, tutor and teach them music. And so he got embarrassed about that. He said, I don't want people thinking that I'm a drunk. So he kind of cut back on his music business. I said, now, wait a minute. How, how important is this income for you? So, uh, and, and, you know, you're, you're allowing other people's, you know, kind of ideas or thoughts or judgments about you to kind of ruin your career. And so he realized that he had self-esteem issues and he felt that he needed other people's acceptance and approval in order to feel worthwhile about himself. So he was able to work on that quite successfully. He went back to his full-time, you know, uh, music teaching and realized that other people's approval and acceptance really should not be a priority with me. My priority should be my approval and my self-acceptance, not other people's. Also, people frequently get you know, uh, chronically upset about that life is not fair. Um, and um, and I don't know how we come to learn in life that life should be fair. If I do all the right things, then good things will happen to me. Well, that's a that's a myth that causes a lot of distress. You know, is it fair that you have MS? Is it fair that you earn that we earn what we earn, and entertainers make twenty million dollars a year? Is that fair? Is it fair that you know it, uh, just walk through any children's cancer ward? and you'll realize how unfair life is. So when you're kind of feeling distressed because life is not fair, that's something that if you change your thinking about that and accept that uh, fairness has nothing to do with life, you'll probably find you're much less distressed, you know, because that belief is making you upset. So there's been a lot of studies on resiliency, you know, and some studies on MS and resiliency. And one of my students, Beth Gromish, developed and published the MS resiliency scale. And what we found in these studies is that there are a number of things that contributed to resiliency. And resiliency, by definition, is your ability to um, bounce back, you know, after an adverse event. It's your ability to kind of uh, uh, be okay even after an adverse event. And so these are the things that we discovered kind of uh, improve resiliency in persons with MS. These cognitive strategies I've been talking to you about was a big component, you know, of improving resiliency. And you can improve your own, you know, by uh, kind of thinking about things in the way I've been describing, evaluating your expectations and wants and and seeing if they're, and adjusting them to be more congruent with the reality of your everyday life. Um, physical activity and diet have also been found to, uh, was one component of resiliency. So again, um, we know that exercise significantly improves mood and, uh, and contributes to better self-esteem and quality of life. So, we encourage all of our MS patients to engage in safe physical activities that uh, may 
that won't um, overheat them or that they won't injure themselves in and getting a consult from a physical therapist is kind of important uh, for many MS patients before you kind of go on an, on an exercise schedule. But that's very doable and, um, and, and very feasible. MS peer support, getting peer support was found to be an important thing that improves resiliency as well, as well as getting support from family and friends. And the final component of it, you know, in our MS studies was spirituality. And this didn't mean like, you know, being particularly religious, you know, it just meant that having a spiritual side to yourself was, was important, whether that was a, a traditional religion and you were praying, you know, every day, or whether it was kind of just kind of a vague spiritual, uh, spirituality that you realized, you know, there's a some kind of power higher than you in this universe, you know, and um, uh, and it helped people uh, feel that things were more in perspective. Now, when depression occurs, your thinking changes in these ways. You have negative views of yourself, other people, the future, and the world, and these negative perceptions are distorted. They're exaggerated or inaccurate. Um, and so um, when I ask depressed patients, I want you to tell me about a happy memory you have, a very happy memory. And sometimes they can't do it. And they can't do it because those pathways in the brain that are associated with past pleasure are quiet, you know, when they get depressed. So part of the work of reopening those pathways are kind of, uh, we do aside from changing those thoughts that are associated with depression that we talked about before, also by getting them to practice seeing if they can open those pathways and remember a happy moment. And that's why I give the stress diary to have them focus on one event in the day that was very upsetting and another event on the day that was happier or less distressing to let them see those differences and begin to develop and create that ability to um, uh, think of happy things. Think of things that are going right in your life, because all that will combat, you know, uh, uh, depression and, and uh, distressed mood. I put this slide in here for those of you that are on Zoom, um, because there we are in the lab trying to develop better ways to manage mood in a double blind study, which is the, uh, the hallmark of the best kind of clinical trial. So uh, I put this in here because having some humor, trying to laugh at something every day in life also improves mood. So um, during the pandemic, uh, one of the silver linings for us is our godson, uh, who's eight years old, came to live with us for a year because his uh, school went virtual and his parents were both uh, essential workers and they, they couldn't uh, home, homeschool him. And one thing I noticed about kids is they laugh a lot. You know, he must have laughed 50 times a day at something. Kids find life is hilarious. And somehow we lose that as we get older and, and as we grow up and we're burdened with responsibilities and MS and bills and things like that. So um, I encourage people to, um, you know, find something funny every day. Uh, look online for the joke of the day uh, or, uh, you know, binge watch comedies or do something to kind of help make you laugh because that will help open up those pathways in the brain and, um, and enable you to kind of work on changing your mood. Okay. Before I mention problem focused coping and um, when we teach people to improve that, we ask them initially to frame their problems in solvable form. You know, someone came in to me and said, I asked, what's your problem? He said, my problem is my MS. And I said, okay, well, let's break that down. Uh, let's frame it in solvable form. And I encouraged him to make a how-to statement. So, and he said, okay, um, how to, uh, how to cope with the changes in my body at MS. I said, okay, how to cope is a, a 
is uh, kind of framing it in solvable form. And then you got to brainstorm solutions, get maximum input from others, welcome offbeat zany or any suggestions without any judgment during the brainstorming phase. You want to get maximum in there without negating anything. Then after you have brainstorms, then you evaluate potential solution statements or steps in a solution sequence. And then you have to implement something, give it a shot, and then evaluate. How well did that work for you? And then reevaluate and readjust as you need it. So this kind of sequence of steps improves problem-focused coping, which we found in our studies um, significantly improved mood. So, and there's a creative process to problem-focused so, uh, coping. Um, and I get people to try to view obstacles as just temporary challenges to their goal attainment. A lot of behavioral and physical approaches shown to improve mood, yoga, uh, exercise, concentration meditation, mindfulness meditation, uh, becoming absorbed in things that you enjoy, like reading, movies, hobbies, things of that sort. So um, I, I'd like to give you all a, a, a kind of a quick exercise in how you can reduce anxiety. So um, I, I'll bet there's some members of the audience who are stress eaters. They get stressed and they head for the fridge. Um, the reason that we head for the fridge when we're stressed is because when we eat something, digestion begins immediately. And that creates something that increases parasympathetic nervous system activity, which is the relaxation response in the nervous system. But I can teach you how to reduce your stress and get that same parasympathetic activity just by breathing in a particular way. Um, how many of you in the audience are currently breathing? Uh, hopefully all of you, and if one of you finds that you're not, please get off this uh, webinar and dial 911. But uh, uh, if you breathe in a particular way, allowing your exhalation to be twice as long as your inhalation, that will help trigger parasympathetic nervous system activity. I do it by inhaling deeply through my nose and then out through slightly pursed lips very slowly. And pursing my lips allows me to control my rate of exhalation. <clears throat> Other people do it by counting in their heads. Breathe in deep, one, two, three, four, hold your breath, five, six, seven, exhale, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So I'd like to practice this with you right now. I want us all to take three slow, deep breaths, kind of making sure our exhalation is twice as long as your, our inhalation. So let's do this now. you'll notice that there's a subtle relaxation that takes place in the body when you kind of breathe in this way. So um, this is your next homework assignment. I want you to practice breathing this way, taking three slow, deep breaths, you know, making sure your exhalation's twice as long as your inhalation, several times a day. I mean, you're breathing all day anyway. You might as well breathe in a way that will teach your body to relax at your command. And again, if you find yourself getting lightheaded or dizzy by taking those deep breaths, it means that you're breathing in a little too deeply. So breathe in a little less deeply so you don't get lightheaded from the exercise. Okay. Um, I guess it's about quarter to five. So maybe um, should I stop here to take questions or should I? Uh, continue for a few more minutes.
um, if you want to finish, we have time. Uh, I know you had said you had a meeting, so I don't want you to be late for that. But how much time do you have? Uh, we have a few questions in the chat right now. Sure, I have until five o'clock. Okay, so yeah, I guess we can start taking questions here. Um, if okay. you're watching us from Zoom, uh, yes. you can either type your questions into the chat box or the Q&A below if you would like to speak directly to Dr. Foley, you can always use the raise hand feature. And if you're on a phone and you would like to use the raise hand feature, you would just press star nine. I actually do have a question. Um, it goes back to what you were talking about as far as expectation and lowering them in unrealistic situations. So when is having high expectations realistic? And would you say that in some aspects it enables us to maybe disbelieve like, where would you draw the line between lowering one's expectations yet remaining or maintaining belief in the impossible, so to speak? That's a very good question. And I wouldn't frame it as lowering expectations. I would frame it as changing your expectations to be aligned with the reality of your, your situation. So, um, you know, it's great to have high expectations. I mean, that frequently leads us to, to attain our goals. Mm -hmm. So high expectations for yourself uh, is, is generally a good thing. But when, if you find yourself getting chronically irritated or frustrated because of those expectations, well, then I ask you to think about them. Uh, just like my expectations to have an easy drive to the medical school in the Bronx was wildly out of sync with reality of driving around that area. I mean, so I didn't lower my expectations. I just changed them to be more in alignment with reality. And if you do that, um, the irritation, you know, uh, goes away. Thank you. Yeah, changing, not lowering like that. Um, so in the Q&A, we do have an anonymous attendee that uh, says, I was DX with depression 10 years ago. My MS DX arrived only last month. I've never tried antidepressants, only therapy, but I feel worse than ever as far as my mental health. Uh, am, I do am I doing myself a disservice by not giving antidepressants a chance? Psychoactive drugs terrify me. So this is a conversation that you need to have with your physician. You know, um, you know, again, there have been clinical trials of antidepressants in MS that have shown, you know, that they have, they improve mood. So, um, but again, you know, uh, I, I, I hear that you're kind of uh, terrified by taking uh, antidepressants. So I think you need some education about them, you know, you know what they what they are, what they do, what side effects do they have, how effective are they, so that you can make a more informed decision um, with your healthcare provider about whether taking an antidepressant is right for you. If you've been depressed for ten years and tried psychotherapy um, and it hasn't worked, you know again you might want to try that cognitive behavior psychotherapy uh, specifically since that has been found to have better efficacy in MS than uh, other types of psychotherapy. Um, and also definitely have that conversation about antidepressants, you know, with your healthcare provider, because you have to weigh the relative risks, you know, uh, and benefits. And so, um, you know, and taking an antidepressant isn't a lifelong commitment. You know, uh, if, you know, you can, Take it and stop it at any point that you want, but you have to give it a fair trial if you're going to decide to take it. And a fair trial means that you have to go get an initial prescription. You'll you may you'll have to go back and see the doctor in a couple of weeks or in a month. You'll have to get the dose adjusted. So it needs to be adjusted for each individual. Unfortunately, we can't tell, you know, what is the right antidepressant and what is the right dose for each particular patient. Because it's a it's a trial and error process. But um, I would strongly encourage you to just talk to your physician about it. We do have a question from Facebook. Lisa wants to know um, how many people are diagnosed with major depression before they're diagnosed with MS and what recommendations are there for dealing with depression if medications don't work? Okay. Um, it's a great question. 
So, uh, and I don't know the answer to how many patients are diagnosed with major depression before they're diagnosed with MS. There is some evidence that depression can be an initial symptom of MS. You know, mm -hmm. from uh, a New York State uh, uh, MS registry, where there were a greater number of people who were diagnosed with depression before the um, diagnosis of MS than should have been, you know, than would be anticipated. So, you know, it is possible that it can show up sometimes as a first symptom of MS uh, before the diagnosis is made. In terms of recommendations for dealing with depression if the medications don't work, and again, um, also, if your physician prescribes an antidepressant and your physician is your general physician or your neurologist, any physician can prescribe antidepressants. But if they, what your physician is prescribing is not working, then I, I recommend to people to see a psychiatrist who is a, you know, an expert in depression uh, and not another physician that may be a generalist or an expert in neurology or an expert you know, in a different area. So, uh, because sometimes uh, psychiatrists will have a better handle on what will work for you as an individual. Um, however, you can go to your uh, you know, provider and, uh, and try the first one and see how well that works. Also, um, uh, I would recommend that cognitive behavior psychotherapy that has been found to be efficacious in persons with MS. We have someone uh, with their hand raised. Tammy, uh, are you there? Please unmute. Yes, thank you. Um, I've had MS 26 years. I'm now in secondary progressive. Um, my, and I'm on antidepressants, but I am angry all the time. My whole personality has changed. And that's one of the reasons why I quit working is because they said that I was sounding angry all the time and I don't mean to but I guess I am and I have and I'm trying to figure out how to fix the anger that I'm feeling all the time. That's a really great uh, great question Tammy. Um, you know and again internally are you aware of feeling angry? Sometimes yes and sometimes no. No. Okay. So, um, because as I mentioned to you before, that uh, phenomenon that occurs in MS called pseudobulbar affect is when you feel one way internally, but your external behavior is different. It's not congruent with the feeling that you have internally. So, those times when you're aware internally that you're that you're angry, and then you're and you're expressing it, well, then that would be incongruence. But you know, I would talk to your healthcare provider, you know, uh, about pseudobulbar affect, you know, to see if that is contributing to what's going on with you. Um, and if not that, you know, um, evaluate what expectations or wants do you have that you're not getting, but you still expect or want when you're angry. Because remember, anger is the feeling that you feel when you expect or want something, you're not getting it, but you still expect or want it. And then evaluate, are your expectations like mine were when it came to driving out of sync with reality? And can you adjust those expectations uh, to be more, more in sync with the reality? Um, I, so um, I, I've worked with a lot of uh, MS patients who, you know, they're used to things being a certain way. They're used to having a certain amount of coordination or they're used to being able to, you know, do things. Uh, and now they can't do them in the same way anymore. And it's very frustrating because it's hard to give up the expectations of being able to do things in a certain way, you know, and that's part of um, the of resiliency of being able to evaluate that and change that. So that would be you know, something that I would ask you to consider. Um, thank you. Is there any possibility because I am, there aren't very many doctors around here, psychologists or psychiatrists. There's one 
do you happen to do like long distance or is there some MS clinic that would do uh, evaluations or help long distance? So what I would recommend you do is um, contact the National MS Society to uh, see if they can uh, give you a provider who can who can do that for you. Also, you can contact um, you know other organizations as well, such as the Consortium of MS Centers, um, or perhaps uh, you know uh, MSAA or you know organizations that what's that may have um, provider lists. And I I would recommend you kind of do that uh, work if you know your local doctors don't have anyone that they can refer you to. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question in the Q&A from Robert. He says, I'm under a very stressful situation. I had an extreme and inappropriate outburst, yelled, swore, and verbally ripped them a new one. Uh, during the outburst, I don't remember everything I said and my vision went black, I couldn't see. This has happened three times since my diagnosis and never before. Is this my MS? A very good question, you know, um, and I certainly don't know the answer for that, but it could be, you know, um, and, and again, sometimes what happens in MS is there's something called um, uh, emotional liability that can occur, and it means that you lose your capacity to inhibit the expression of very strong emotions, and so when and and that happens, you know, particularly in uh, patients who have some changes in the frontal lobe of the brain in MS. And so that inability to inhibit, you know, the expression of that. And it sounds like, you know, um, you know, you're saying that your 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 anger is really um, not appropriate at those moments. So I, I would again, recommend that you uh, talk to your healthcare provider, talk to your doctor about it, um, and let them eva have you evaluated further for that to see, you know, what is likely causing that. I have a few more questions in the Q&A. Elizabeth, um, this question kind of ties into the higher expectations and whether or not it's better to have them. She says uh, she worries that realistic expectations could result in self-fulfilling prophecies. So maybe it's better to have higher expectations. You know, again, a good question. Try not to think in terms of higher and lower. Try to think in terms of, are my expectations realistic? So, uh, so I, I don't want anyone to lower their expectations. You know, um, but I, I want them to evaluate them to see if those expectations are causing them tremendous frustration or irritability or anger, you know, um, because if they are, well, then maybe they need to be changed, not lowered, just to be more in sync with the situation that you're facing. And it looks like uh, it's 4.58. I have that time, so we may have time only for one more question. Um, Teresa says, when doing these breathing exercises, is it more beneficial to breathe from the diaphragm? I'm hearing um, diaphragm is connected more to the nervous system. Um, yes. When you want to take those deep breaths, you really want to expand your abdomen and diaphragm. You know, uh, you want to move that diaphragm. Take, take a nice deep breath. Kind of, uh, you might even want to put your hands on your abdomen to make sure you can really feel it expanding. You know, uh, when you're taking that deep breath. But again, um, you know, you have to make sure there's no uh, contraindications for breathing deeply. Like, like if you have COPD or you know some other some lung problems. Or, um, uh, and again, if you're when you're doing it. If you get dizzy or lightheaded, then take your means you're breathing a little too deeply. So um, what I'll do, Dr. Foley, is email you 
um, the last three questions that we have in the chat. And then uh, at your earliest convenience, if you could answer those. And um, for the anonymous attendees and Elizabeth, whose questions went unanswered today, please um, just keep an eye out, hopefully, or you can respond to the email registration. Uh, with Kamani, the I, I, I'll take a few more questions. Okay, awesome. I'll, perfect. Never okay. mind. I'll, <laughs> so, I'll finish it up. Um, no worries. Uh, Elizabeth asks again, how do we deal with symptoms and disabilities that vary significantly day to day, hour to hour? I feel like I'm making progress and then uh, regress. You know, another great question. And this is one of the things that people with MS face, you know, uncertainty. How am I going to feel later? How am I going to feel tomorrow? Can I make a commitment to, you know, go to dinner on Friday night with friends when I don't know if my fatigue will be, you know, so bad I won't be able to do it? So, um, you know, again, learning to cope with uncertainty is one of the necessary skills that everyone with MS has to acquire because um, you know, and so, uh, you know, they, they, you have to educate others about your MS. Sure, I would love to go out to dinner on Friday night, um, but uh, as long as my MS is okay that evening, you know, I'll be able to do it. So you, you'll, ha you'll have to kind of, uh, when you're making commitments sometimes, introduce, let people know that it depends on the MS that day. Likewise, with activities you want to uh, do and engage with. Well, it depends on the MS that day or that time. And so you, you, you'll have to be kind of uh, flexible and adjusting your schedule and educating others on, um, you, know, you know, on the, uh, you know, the fluctuations that you experience and adjust your daily schedule accordingly. An anonymous attendee um, says, can you speak to um, mood swings with MS and menopause? I find at times it's hard to control and deal with. Okay. Uh, menopause can be associated with mood swings and uh, it frequently is. Um, and if you have mood swings from MS and mood swings from menopause, you may be experiencing them more intensely. So, um, but again, but managing them, you know, is, uh, is the same uh, ways that we've mentioned. You know, if the mood swings, you know, include a lot of depression or a lot of sadness, you know, or a lot of anger, well then engaging in that cognitive behavior therapy uh, will have a high probability of helping or, you know, getting <clears throat> an anti-anxiety or anti a depressant medication from your healthcare provider. So the treatment is the same, the management is the same, regardless of whether they're coming from menopause or MS. And the last question we have is from another anonymous attendee. It says, is there a difference between uh, antidepressant treatment for someone with MS or without MS? The things, uh, in, in general, no. Although the thing that we found in MS is that many times uh, you have to push the doses higher in MS than kind of in, in a population who doesn't have MS. And that's why I mentioned to you um, that, you know, go to your usual regular healthcare provider first to get a prescription, but sometimes non-psychiatrists are a little nervous about, you know, kind of prescribing higher doses of antidepressants because it's not their specialty. You know, their specialty is neurology or general medicine or uh, gerontology. So, um, so that's why if, you know, the first antidepressant doesn't work well for you, um, I recommend people go see a specialist, a psychiatrist, who will work with you more closely and with a greater expertise on helping you manage that mood. So, um, Kathy wants to just say hello and that she admires you very much. Um, and that looks like all the questions that we um, that we answered. Thank you so much for taking a few extra minutes to answer those last few. But um, that's all the time we have for now, everyone. If you did miss any part of the conference, please head over to 
the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation Facebook page. Once the presentation is over here, the live stream will appear there. Um, eventually, the recording of this conference will also be on our YouTube channel, Multiple Sclerosis Foundation, uh, our MS Focus SoundCloud page, and msfocusradio.org. If you remember to follow us across the board on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you'll get times and access information. And our next conference will be this Thursday, October 6th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time with Dr. Augusto Miravalle for Spanish or Hispanic Heritage Month and how MS plays a role on the Latino community. So we want to thank all of the participation from the attendees, and we'd like to also thank Dr. Foley for uh, taking the time out of his day, his busy day, to um, share this information with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kamani, and thank you, everybody, for spending this time together. Take care. Thank you.